So first, my Arizona trail journey began with a flight from Denver to Tucson, shuttle to Sierra Vista, a Walmart run for groceries, and a ride from Mike and Angie, awesome trail angels from Sierra Vista. I stayed at Mike and Angie's house for the evening, and it was definitely a daunting view out there back window to Miller Peak. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't nervous for the first day. I got a ride pretty early in the morning, probably around 6.30 or so, from Mike to Coronado National Monument. That is where the trail begins. I hiked 1.7 miles down to the border, touched the monument down at the border to Mexico, and then started my trek. Day one on the Arizona Trail. We'll see how long this takes, how long I last, and uh, Hopefully it's the start of an experience of a lifetime. Let's do this. It was 13 miles or so up and over Miller Peak that very first day. It definitely was a difficult first day. Climbing through the clouds and the fog, passing by abandoned mines, meeting a bunch of different through hikers that first day, starting off as well, including Chuckles. We actually ended up hiking the first 375 miles of the trail together. And so it was really cool to run into him the first day. There was a couple of miles of snow even, starting from the spur to the peak. And then after that, uh, through bathtub springs, there was about two and a half miles of snow. Had to get through that, but otherwise it wasn't too bad. All right, good morning. I think I clocked in 14.8 miles yesterday, like 4,000 feet of vertical gain and loss. So it was a pretty big day for the first day. Camped with uh, three other people in the campsite and that was uh, definitely nice to have other people to converse with and ask a few questions and tips and everything so i'm definitely thankful for that time to hit the trail again for today and probably going to aim for about 15 miles today Day two was definitely a big reprieve from day one. Flatter trail, uh, winding through the hills of uh, Parker Canyon and around Parker Lake. A lot less steep up and down the mountains like the first day up and over Miller Peak. There was also a fellow AZT biker that passed by named Bluebird. He stopped to chat a while, so that was pretty cool. I have about 500 feet more of elevation gain. Should get there around five or so, maybe a little before, maybe a little after, but we'll see. And I caught up with Chuckles and we set up camp around a tank that night, which is basically just a cow pond. This first trail region of the Arizona Trail is called the Sky Islands. From low deserts to high 10,000 foot mountains, the result is an incredible range of landscapes and plant and animal life. Wow, this is one of the first absolutely spectacular views. It was a cold night and I woke up to frost around seven. I ran into Patty from Butte, Montana and her dog Stella <laughs> after Stella art walk. I hiked and chatted with her for Bye. a couple miles before she turned around.
made camp near a few grazing cows after reaching the trail connector in Patagonia. It was an amazing sunset and I made dinner, fire, and chatted with Alexi from Quebec and Hook Up from Wisconsin. Good morning. It's day four on the trail. I'm about five miles from Patagonia. There's a chance I might get a ride into town from a trailhead because my knee, my right knee is really killing me. I don't know if it was from the downhill after Miller Peak. Took a couple painkillers and I'm gonna see how it feels. As of now, it doesn't feel too great. <laughs> you can kind of see Patagonia in the distance back there. Probably about a mile and a half away. I'm almost there. Keeping me going. Take the whole afternoon off and then see where I'm at and restart tomorrow. I went to the saloon for dinner with Chuckles and Hookup and had a lemonade and a bacon cheeseburger with fries that tasted pretty darn good. Hung out by the fire that evening and a javelina passed right on by. After an amazing half day rest yesterday at Terrasol, I am heading into Patagonia, resupplying some food, and then head back out on the trail. About six and a half mile road walk to Temporal Gulch. This road actually used to be the old AZ2 route. Probably take a quick lunch when I get up there and see how far I wanna go this afternoon. You almost forget to just turn around and look at the views around you. There's some amazing views of the mountains here. just absolutely amazes me how this is Arizona. How you can have such strong and deep running creeks. Some of the comments on the Far Out app say that it's like a river. It's not even a stream, it's like a river. This climb has been pretty difficult. I probably have a mile and a half left, but after that, probably camp pretty close to the top of the ridge there. I call it a day. After climbing the saddle of Mount Wrightson and down Casablanca Canyon, I camped with Durango Joe, Lily Ann, and Chuckles. The next morning, I left camp after Durango Joe. We walked by so many abandoned gold mining areas around Granite Mountain, although it doesn't seem like any of them were that successful. We stopped for lunch at Kentucky Camp, which was an old mining cabin area the Forest Service is restoring. I hiked about 15 and a half miles that day, which turns out to be about the sweet spot. There was so much wind that day, there had to be gusts up to 40 or 50 miles an hour on top of the ridge. I met a group on horses and talked with them a while before settling into camp near Enzenberg Canyon. Shout out to Durango Joe for sharing an extra bean burrito with me for dinner.
I saw my first real barrow, ocotillo, and prickly pear cacti for this trip today. A little taste of what's ahead. I hiked all day with Durango Joe, who told inspiring stories of sled dog guiding and boundary waters, circumnavigating Lake Superior in a kayak, and a continental divide bike trip. Mile 100, let's go! <laughs> Got a little trail magic here. Amazing to see. Donuts, fruit, chips. Holy crap. Massive shout out to Zach for the trail magic. I really appreciate it. It was a cold afternoon with fog, but no wind or rain. After a solid 18 mile day, Durango Joe, Chuckles, and I set up camp near Twin Tanks. Really just a murky cow pond about six and a half miles outside of Vail. I definitely needed another rest in Vail before the climb through the prominent Rincon and Santa Catalina Mountains. First rest day here in Vail, it feels so good. I took an ice bath, now I'm just kicking my feet up, watching March Madness, watching Yukon destroy Arkansas so far. Go Huskies. Oh my goodness. That overnight in this hotel felt absolutely amazing. About to head to Dollar General to resupply on food for the next four or five days. This is a huge part of the trip very difficult coming up gonna climb micah mountain and mount lemon into summer haven so it's gonna be a rough few days in a row and i'm hoping my body is up for it i'm hoping i'm up for it only a couple miles back on trail and we passed the karst of colossal cave this cave was formed by rainwater, which has shaped sinkholes, depressions, and caverns into the limestone. Millions of years ago, when this land was an ocean bottom, this limestone rock was formed by plant and animal remains and sediments accumulating on the ocean floor. That's a behemoth if I've ever seen one. I had about 14 miles to hike that day to Rincon Creek and the edge of Saguaro National Park. I ran into hookup for the last four or five miles into camp. He crossed Rincon Creek. Meanwhile, me and Chuckle stayed back. A half dozen of us through hikers were camped just outside the park, staring straight at Micah Mountain, blocking our path. This section passes through the mighty Santa Catalina and Rincon Mountains. This metamorphic core complex formed 25 million years ago when crustal extension caused uplifting and a detachment fault. This fault created a dome-like range on its lower plate, which is the Catalina and Rincon Mountains. The upper plate, the Tucson Mountains, was displaced 20 miles to the east. This was a very intimidating section of the trail and I wasn't sure if I was really ready for it at the time. Mother, father, breath of ever-flowing spring love guides us on our way, guides us on our way, guides us on I woke up early that morning around 6.30 to frost covering my tent Good in a very morning. cold morning. If I ever close my tent, there's little to no airflow inside. It's very easy for condensation to build up on the top, both on the inside and the outside of the tent. If it's cold at all, if the dew settles, then there's gonna be frost and it's gonna ice over at night, which is not ideal. I ended up crossing Rincon Creek that morning around 7.30. It was very cold, but I took my shoes off for it 
uh, dried off my feet and just put my shoes back on. And I started the climb up Micah Mountain, which was about 13 and a half miles and 5,500 feet up. We stopped for lunch at Grass Shack Camp and talked to a ranger who reassured we were allowed to camp at Manning Camp near the peak. This is by far the hardest day of hiking I've ever done. <laughs> I've probably gone about 11 miles, maybe close to 11 and a half miles so far. I have two and a half miles to Manning Camp. I'm just uh, one foot in front of the other, just trying to get up there. I was definitely feeling the elevation too. Chuckles and I made a fire at Manning Camp. I had cold ramen for dinner and headed to bed early thinking the next couple days may not be much easier. Bright and early, we climbed the last 500 feet of Micah Mountain and admired the astonishing views. We hiked 6,000 feet down the other side, including two miles of snow on the trail, which made the descent quite interesting. Holy. There's Mount Lemon in the background, what I think is Mount Lemon. It'll probably be two more days until we get there. You can kind of see, you can actually see like the outskirts of Tucson there in the background. It was amazing to hike another 12 miles further and see Micah in the rear view. At that point, I had about 13 and a half more miles weaving through the hills before Mount Lemon. The past couple days climbing up and over Micah Mountain had been epic, but I was insanely tired. I'm most of the way out of Agua Caliente drainage, but man, I'm struggling. This is a very difficult climb. One last push and I was hoping to make it into Oracle the next day for a full day rest. I stopped at Molino Basin Campground for a snack and to resupply on some valuable toilet paper. One of the most amazing campsites of the entire trail was along Sabino Creek, right next to Hutch's Pool with an awesome waterfall and swimming hole. The water was absolutely ice cold, but I at least went under for a couple seconds. Chuckles and I set up our tents on a ledge overlooking the creek. And once again, this is a spot I'm definitely coming back to. All right, the climb up Lemon. Let's do it. What a beautiful morning. Tried to wake up pretty early just to uh, get out of the canyon there before it gets too hot. It's about six miles, 3,500 feet to the first peak. And then it's like a thousand feet down, a thousand feet back up to uh, Summer Haven. Just gonna try and grind it out. Basically this whole time you can look back and see a view of Micah. Still just chugging along on this mountainside. It is so overgrown. The grass is really tall. I'm definitely glad I'm wearing pants. I don't know how some people do this wearing shorts. By the time I was halfway up Mount Lemon, I was absolutely destroyed. Felt like a mix of uh, crying, stopping, quitting, throwing up, everything. It was absolutely awful, but uh, I just kept on going.
My shoes were filled with mica flakes. They were falling apart. I was uh, getting a hot spot. I was sweating so much. It was not a good day. <laughs> Basically just a ton of excuses to make it once again my hardest day of hiking ever. It's basically four o'clock. I'm dead. Nine hours on the trail. I felt like I was gonna throw up for the past like two miles. Thing is, I still have a couple more to go. <laughs> We're almost there and that's all that matters. Summer Haven is located at 8,200 feet and was rebuilt after the devastating Aspen fire of 2003. It is one of only three communities the AZT passes through the middle of. A mile up to Summer Haven. Heck of a day and it's gonna feel absolutely amazing to get up there. Bro, this is literally heaven. Thank you so much. I honestly can't even believe what just happened. They're only open to five. I got there like 5.05 and I just like looked in and waved. They came and opened the door for me and they gave me this entire pizza, just free. A couple extra slices too and an entire cookie. That just made my day, my week, and probably this whole trip so far. I got a day's worth of snacks, a cream soda, hot chocolate. Chuckles and I walked another mile up the road to camp with an astounding view of the sunset over Oracle Ridge. It was a downright awful, rocky fire road that led us down Mount Lemon into Oracle. I met Baja Gringo along the way down. Chuckles and I walked into town and found a great brunch spot at Patio Place. I had the green chili chorizo huevos ranchero special and an ice cold lemonade. getting some laundry done here. I'm at El Rancho Robles Guest Ranch in Oracle, Arizona. It's definitely an awesome spot and a great place for AZT hikers. You can stay here, set up a tent for 20 bucks a night and uh, showers, bathroom, laundry. I highly recommend if you need a resupply in Oracle, come here for sure. Back on trail, it was my longest day so far, 21 and a half miles. Feels good to be back on the trail again. 58 miles or so to Kearney. So it should be there in three to four days. A lot of uh, flat-ish terrain, some hills, no crazy mountains or anything in between. Final shout out to Carol here in Oracle, Arizona. Absolutely amazing, just a sweetheart. Took me to the dollar store and to get lunch and dinner a couple times and things like that. Trying to do what she can for the Arizona trail hikers and she's uh, thoroughly exceeding expectations. So shout out to Carol. Pals ended up skipping Oracle as well, and I caught up to them, and we all ate lunch at Mountain View Tank. From there, we basically leapfrogged all day, just passing each other back and forth before we set up camp at Beehive Well. This turned out to be a major trip-changing moment for me. The Pals had four or five different stoves between them, and they ended up giving me a stove, the full thing of fuel as well. So I can't describe how greatly I appreciate the Pals. Before that, I was just cold soaking ramen and couscous, and now I can cook warm dinners. Thank you, the pals. It was back-to-back 20-mile -back days hiking through the hot and dry desert lowlands. 
I had lunch at a stock tank and camped after finding water at a wildlife tank. It's become a habit catching up to Chuckles in the afternoon and finding a water source to camp. Not a bad routine. That night we were treated to a great weather and once again a breathtaking colorful sunset. Well, that was completely unexpected. I just pulled up to the next water source here and there's Jupiter Hikes from YouTube. I was like, holy crap, I know you, right? He's like a hundred miles into the Grand Enchantment Trail, starting from Phoenix, about to cut east towards Albuquerque. So it's really funny to run into him considering he's like the main reason why I'm out here. And I'm uh, definitely happy I got to meet him, so shout out to Jupiter. From this spot on the trail, I can see Kearney in the distance. Kearney is the largest of the Copper Corridor communities in the region and was named after mid-1800s frontier General Stephen Kearney. The town is at the base of the Pinal Mountains and was established in 1954 to accommodate nearby mining operations. I ended up seeing my first rattlesnake of the trip about a mile and a half before the Gila River Trailhead. Dave from Alaska gave me and another couple hikers, Calamity and Mama Turtle, a ride into town. We all headed to Old Time Pizza and I refueled with a pepperoni pizza and a Mountain Dew. Few of us got a ride back to the trailhead with the famous Greg, the owner of Old Town Pizza. It was funny, at the end of the ride, he asked me if I speak, and I guess my mind was just uh, too filled thinking about the sections ahead. I was thoroughly enjoying my afternoon and became the caboose of the group that day, filming and taking pictures along the way. As of yesterday on the trail, I made it to the low point of the trail at 1,646 feet near the Gila River. I'm preparing to hike entering the Arizona Sonoran Upland section, a region that provides a transition between the Sonoran Desert and the wetter, cooler high country of the north. It encompasses the heavily dissected mountainous areas between the Mogollon Rim and the Verde, Gila, and Salt River Canyons. Little did I know, I was entering what would be my favorite section of the Arizona Trail. We set up camp near a river and I cooked warm ramen with chicken and beef jerky. I couldn't stop smiling as my first warm meal both tasted and felt so good. The Superstition Volcanic Zone represents a transition from the basin and range to the central highlands. The Superstition Mountain's eight mile diameter caldera lacked the single eruption strength of Yellowstone, but it managed to pump out 2,500 cubic miles of ash and lava. The current superstitions are a resurgent dome that has been eroded and faulted over time to give us this dramatic range. Two of the most visible landmarks, Weaver's Needle and Picket Post Mountain, a resistant erosional remnants of the cataclysm.
It was a pretty seamless day climbing from the Gila River up and over to Picket Post Mountain. There were dramatic wildflowers the entire time, great views behind me, and awesome rock formations surrounding me. We hit mile 300 in the afternoon as well. The steep rocky trails sure made you work, but the views in the superstition wilderness were absolutely worth it. Good morning from Picket Post Mountain. I ended up hitting mile 300 yesterday, so that's a pretty big milestone. Definitely happy to hit that. I only have about three more miles to make it to the road and hitch into Superior, take a half day, mostly full day, spend the night and probably get back on the trail tomorrow. I ended up catching a ride from the Picket Post Mountain Trailhead with Baja Gringo and Chuckles from a former AZT through hiker and a really cool guy. Superior is set in an area with a rich mining history and cultural significance. The town sits in between the impressive mass of Picket Post Mountain and the cliffs of Apache Lee. Superior actually turned out to be my favorite trail town and a great day rest. Up until now, it hadn't been too hot, but there was 95 degree weather in the forecast. So some through hikers were actually planning to hitch a ride further north to Pine and then hike south. So they were trying to avoid some heat, especially for some of these sections that had more climbing in them. I thought about it, but I just ultimately decided to hike on. We got a ride back to the trail from Al around 8.15 in the morning. Second rattlesnake, sweating like crazy, it's pretty hot out here. And I was just head down, and this guy, he got up looking like one of those cobras, and he was moving really quick. He's still really mad and just hanging out in the bush, using his rattler. We climbed 4,000 feet out of Superior that afternoon. And at the top of the ridge, I met the Muppets, an awesome duo from London and Philly. We took a little break and talked about our experiences up to this point being first time through hikers. I headed on a bit further to find some water and right on time, I ran into Chuckles to make camp along the forest road. Had another delicious meal of mashed potatoes, chicken salad, and Taco Bell hot sauce for dinner. I was really loving the new stove system. It ended up being another chilly night that evening, up on top of the ridge at elevation. There was a decent amount of wind and airflow, but just camping under the trees just created some condensation, and it was definitely chilly that evening. By 8.15, I was hiking and made it to the Superstition Wilderness Boundary. Definitely some big ups and downs navigating the Superstition ridges. I hiked another 10 miles or so and stopped for lunch along Pine Creek. Like clockwork, Chuckles caught up for the afternoon hike. Just like that, after rounding the corner, we caught our first view of Four Peaks. We ascended the ridge and I found a campsite with an amazing 360 degree view. It was too rocky for a tent, so it was my first time cowboy camping under the stars.
All right, well, first night cowboy camping out here. I didn't sleep very well, to be honest. I kept hearing mosquitoes, so I had to put my earplugs in, and cover my head with my coat and everything. Eventually fell asleep and it felt pretty good out here. No condensation at all. No, uh, didn't get too cold or anything. So feeling all right. Time to get to Roosevelt Lake by today. I ended up seeing my first Gila monster in the middle of the trail and another rattlesnake further ahead. I caught up a bit again with the Muppets and unfortunately had to say peace to Baja Gringo who was leaving the trail dealing with foot injuries. Props to him for pushing through the superstitions. It wasn't exactly feeling right that evening as Chuckles hadn't caught up the afternoon yet. Bad news ended up piling on as I got a message from him saying that he had stomach problems and he had to fall behind. Little did I know I wouldn't see him again for the rest of the trip. Shout out to Chuckles for sure. He answered a ton of my questions and definitely helped me get through the first three weeks of my Arizona trail through hiking. Most of us camping at the lake woke up bright and early around 4.30, 4.45 to get a head start and beat the sun and the heat, climbing into Four Peaks Wilderness that day. It was the biggest climb of the trip so far and it happened to fall on the hottest day of the trip also. I chose to take the road walk across the bridge and got to the trail by six. It was a dramatic trek to the top of Four Peaks Wilderness. On Four Peaks, the less resistant granite has eroded away, leaving away resistant quartzite. It's said that Four Peaks have quartzite teeth on granite gums. These peaks provide an amazing view for people many miles in every direction. Four Peaks Wilderness is definitely a special place for me. I grew up visiting my grandparents in Fountain Hills, Arizona, and we always had a view out the back window. The feeling of finally being able to hike up and over the Four Peaks Wilderness area was incomparable. After 7,000 feet of elevation gain, I got to my campsite by Shake Spring right after 4 p.m. I washed some clothes and soaked my feet in the freezing stream and hung a clothes on. Baja Gringo's sweet potatoes, spam, and bone broth was so good for dinner, and I called it an early night. After descending the other side of Four Peaks, I stopped for lunch at a Little Pine Flat. I had Baja Gringo's dehydrated mac and cheese with tuna and hot sauce for lunch. I didn't feel great, so I laid down for four hours. I hiked another four miles that evening and set up camp by Boulder Creek. It's kind of fun setting your own schedule for the day based on how you're feeling and the weather.
I ran into another couple hikers, Cheeks and Sniffer, heading into the highway intersection at Sunflower. It took us 30 minutes to get a hitch into Payson. I had McDonald's for lunch to satisfy some cravings and got a motel room for the night. I ended up walking to Big Five Sporting Goods for fingerless hiking gloves as the top of my hands were burnt red to a crisp from using hiking poles. That evening, I had the biggest carne asada burrito I've ever had from Alfonso's. I headed to Safeway again for another resupply. I hiked another mile or so out of town and I ran into Kieran from the UK who was hitchhiking around Arizona. We got a ride within five minutes from two lovely Navajo ladies heading to Phoenix. She told me on top of the Mogollon Rim is a creepy place filled with spirits and don't follow any sounds you hear outside of your tent at night. How reassuring. All right, back on the trail. Spent the night in Payson, did my normal uh, town routine. Got a hitch back to the trailhead today and hiked about five or six miles. Decided to camp here. There's a, a creek or a wash about a quarter mile back at the most, so good source of water there. Yeah, probably about to make some dinner and call it a night. Just got word a couple days ago that the Grand Canyon Trail is closed until like June. This is now the heart of the amazing Mazatzals. The Mazatzals consist of Four Peaks region, Pine Mountain, Saddle Mountain, the Mazatzal Divide, and the Red Hills. This is the largest range in the Transition Zone province, also known as the Central Highlands. Wow, pretty amazing day. Hit mile 400 today. Probably gonna end up at uh, 412, 413-ish by the end of the day. More than halfway, and with the Grand Canyon closed, a lot more than halfway, but absolutely beautiful views. So much greenery, but not as much water. A lot of the mountain creeks here and the washes are drying up. The snow is melting fast based off of uh, previous people's comments. I hiked another 5,000 feet up, back to the highest altitude since Mount Lemmon, and I'm definitely noticing more and more pines. I got water that evening at Bear Spring an algae filled spring that smelled and tasted like rotten eggs. You add a couple noon tablets to your water and it tastes just fine. I enjoyed another awesome sunset and cooked Spanish rice to make burritos with cheese and chili fritos on top. All right, time to try these burritos. Just whipped up some rice, put some chicken in there, cut up some medium sharp cheddar cheese and threw some chili cheese nachos Fritos on top of that. Definitely eating a lot different than when I started the trip. And it's kind of funny to see that evolution into bringing more food and more interesting food. At this point, the majority of fellow through hikers that I'm talking to are planning on either bailing at Pine or Flagstaff. Whether it be injury, snow, mud, flooding, the canyon trail closures, 
or personal reasons, the majority of hikers were leaving the trail. I really wanted to make it to at least the south rim of the Grand Canyon, even if I couldn't make it all the way to the Utah border. I was both excited and relieved to have my first sighting of the Mogollon Rim from the trail. The rim is named after the Mogollon culture, one of the major prehistoric cultural divisions of the Southwest. The Mogollon might as well be referred to as mountain peoples because they inhabited the rugged, high elevation mountain and canyon country of eastern Arizona and parts of New Mexico, Mexico, and Texas. There's the Mogollon Rim. First view of the rim from here. That's probably about 60, 65 miles away from here. About half that into pine, another 30 or so until we get on top of the Mogollon Rim. From there, the trail gets a lot flatter, but there's a lot more snow up there. It's higher elevation and the snow is melting. So there's a lot more mud. Just have to take it day by day, like I said before. This is the East Verde River. I think at this point, I'm gonna have to commit to wet shoes or take them off and uh, tie them to my backpack and go barefoot. That wasn't too bad at all. It only got up to above my knees once, just for like one step. I'm gonna take a break here, take a lunch, hopefully dry off some stuff, filter some water and keep on going. I had bypassed about five miles of flooded trail into Pine, and a lovely couple actually picked me up alongside the highway into Pine, recognized me as a through hiker, and took me into town, so I greatly appreciated that. I resupplied at Ponderosa Market and had an elk burger and Arizona Trail Ale at that brewery. Instead of staying at a hiker hostel that night, I opted to walk about half a mile back to Pine Trailhead to set up my tent. The Pine Trailhead actually had a not so welcoming sign and note from the National Park Service that was warning us through hikers about the conditions on top of the Mogollon Rim. Regardless, I continued the hike up the Highline Trail, paralleling the rim all afternoon. I was noticing thicker pine forests and lots more water again. Made it to the Mogollon Rim. It's pretty cool walking in the pines and coming down this hill and this ridge. We're only getting closer. I remember seeing it 60 miles back and it's cool to watch things uh, get closer and further away from you as you travel. I think this Highline Trail just kind of hugs the rim and it shoots up it in about 10 miles. And now that we're in higher elevation and back in the pines, a lot more water, maybe there's more wildlife too. I camped near Chase Creek Tributary with mile 500 on the agenda for tomorrow. That morning I had about four miles to hike straight up the Mogollon Rim.
I took about a 30 minute pack off detour at an abandoned, collapsed railroad tunnel. It's all about the side journeys along the way. There were a few miles of snowy trail, but it wasn't too bad, and it even made it a bit fun, although slow. Back in the snow, on top of the rim, and just like the comments said, snow starts at mile 485, which is the top of the rim right there. I thought that was a mountain lion at first, but well, that was definitely just a coyote, like a hundred yards away. <laughs> What a beautiful river this is. I think this is Clear Creek. I think I've done about 12 miles today. It's probably 1.15 in the afternoon. The plan is to figure out the best way to cross uh, without getting too wet. Don't want anything above like thigh or waist high. Oh my gosh. This is like, as cold as the Alaska water when I was in Denali. I crossed East Clear Creek knee high and dried off all my gear during lunch. I was so glad to be hiking in the shade and see lots of wildlife, as I had already seen a coyote and about five elk. Five miles later, I came across an empty Blue Ridge campground, closed for the season, but open to through hikers. Man, quite the chilly morning this morning. It's probably the first night that got under freezing. There was some ice in my water bottles and frost and everything, but not too much condensation. So I don't know, I stayed warm in the sleeping bag. Had to hike in by about 6.20. I want to put in a longer day today so I can get to Mormon Lake tomorrow. Just ran into a ranger also. Oh, no way. It's the 500 mile mark. Let's go. Found the resupply box, just getting some Spanish rice, an extra meal if I need it, teriyaki seasoning, because why not, and a packet of island punch. I don't think I've ever been in more pain. It's not every single step, but it's like every... 10 or 15 steps, so I just get the sharpest pain in my right Achilles. It's almost further up. Something is pulled, something is torn. I can feel it. it just depends on how serious it is. You know, I'm just so lucky it happened in this section. This is the best section for it to happen in terms of temperature, shade, water availability elevation change close enough to a couple towns just if this was like in the middle of the four peaks wilderness i would be screwed for a while now i had actually been looking forward to a lot easier and flatter trail up on the colorado plateau which encompasses the area from the mogollon rim to the utah border most through hikers say it's smooth sailing to the canyon on top of the rim and I thought I was so ready for it. But at that moment, I thought it could be my last night on the trip.
Well, good morning. It is the 22nd, I believe. I don't know what day of the week. I'm feeling all right. I can't quite tell how my Achilles feels. I have to probably walk half mile and then it'll either be all right or it'll just be right back to where it was yesterday afternoon. I downed a couple of painkillers and hiked four miles to a connecting forest road and another three to county road. So what's your trail name? Hippie. Hippie? Yes. 10 minutes of road walking later and a couple from Kansas recognized me as a through hiker and pulled over to offer me a ride. They gave me a cookie, a Dr. Pepper, and a ride to Mormon Lake. All right, just got my box from Mormon Lake. Couldn't find anywhere to plug in my electronics and charge. So I'm out of here. I'm hiking 2.6 miles to Double Springs Campground. I think it'll be a lot nicer than trying to stay anywhere near Mormon Lake because it's not really that nice of an area. Here's my campsite though, it's right next to the road. I think the Arizona Trail is just like a quarter mile ahead. All right, good morning again. Day 36, 37, something like that. Who knows at this point. I'm at the stream crossing from the campground to continue on the Arizona Trail, but it's completely flooded. I decided that I'm gonna build a little bridge to the other side. Got a couple logs here and I'm gonna add to it. Check it out. Trail is a stream. <laughs> this is pretty crazy. This is just supposed to be like a pretty small pond. But this year, it is a lake. That morning, I crossed Walnut Creek, again at about knee high, and took the urban route into Flagstaff. Dry off my feet, put my shoes and socks back on. Maybe uh, filter some water here, grab another liter or so. 
and have a snack and keep on going. I'm excited to get to Flagstaff. I had a massive Taco Bell lunch and got a room at Motel 6 for a couple nights. Showered, did laundry as usual, got snacks and supplies from Walmart, watched the NBA playoffs, and had yet another carne asada burrito. All right, back on the trail. So probably do four or five miles here today, camp, and then I got about 90 to the south rim of the Grand Canyon. And I'm hoping to do that in five days. Today's Wednesday, hoping to get there by Monday, and then maybe head down into the rim Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. That'll be the absolute ideal situation, and I'm hoping it happens. Heading out of town, I started hiking around Mount Humphreys to Alpha Fia Tank and set up camp. The last two and a half miles of that day were completely covered in snow and at least a foot in most places. That night, I was definitely expecting it to be my coldest night on the trip, easily below 30. Well, good morning and happy birthday to me. Five days to the Grand Canyon. Just my luck, I wake up to the coldest morning of this whole trip. My socks are still wet from yesterday. I tried to dry them out. Luckily, my shoes are still dry. Anyways, let's get going. I woke up at 5.30 and was hiking at 6.30 to take advantage of the cold morning and the packed snow that was easier to walk on than the mushy afternoon wet snow. Pretty amazing how far we've come. It's hard to even fathom making it this far. Walked another five miles and set up camp around 4 p.m. It was a weird feeling not seeing anyone else all day. A lonely but peaceful birthday. I had now passed the San Fran Mountains, which includes Mount Humphreys, Arizona's highest point and the tallest mountain at 12,633 feet. It's the only strata volcano in Arizona, a cone-shaped volcano similar to Fuji and Rainier. These peaks are very sacred to many Native American tribes. Headed to the Grand Canyon. Really can't believe it. Walking 670 miles from the border. Seeing the scenery change over time. The different weather, the different terrain, trees, the different animals. Seeing everything just change over time. From desert to mountain to forest and everything in between. It's pretty wild to me that the Grand Canyon is only 30 miles ahead. In the past four or five days have been like completely flat. And then it's just like a 7,000 foot giant gorge, giant canyon out of nowhere. I caught my first view of the Grand Canyon from Grand View Tower. Formed by the uplift of the Colorado Plateau, down cut by the Colorado River, and massive erosion over a short geological period in time, the Grand Canyon is 277 miles long, 18 miles across, 6,000 feet down, and more than 2 billion years of history can be seen in its layers. After 700 grueling miles, I had made it to my destination, 
the south rim of the Grand Canyon. I camped at Mather Campground and planned for the moment I had been waiting for. So road of red eclipse my soul. Tell me secrets only you know and paint the skies of crimson gold. See, I will listen to the stars in the storm. I made it to Bright Angel Campground around 9.45 in the morning. I snagged a campsite by the water, laid down, and reminisced on my trip. I explored a couple miles further up Bright Angel Creek before heading back for lunch and relaxing the rest of the afternoon. Raven actually ended up stealing a cliff bar from my table. I couldn't pitch my tent with the hard dirt, so I resorted to cowboy camping for the night. What an absolutely gorgeous view of the waxing gibbous moon rising above the canyon and illuminating the opposite wall.
Once again, thanks to Mike and Angie and Sierra Vista and guiding me through the start of my journey. Shout out to all the fellow hikers that I ran into this season. Shout out to trail angels Mary and Lulu from Terrasol, Zach from Tucson, Greg from Kearney, Carol from Oracle, and Al in Superior. Shout out to the random people giving me rides into Payson, Sunflower, Pine, and at the end of the trail to Cameron and all the way to Salt Lake City. Shout out to Taylor and Emily for allowing me to stay in Salt Lake City for the weekend before getting a bus back to home in Denver. Through this trip, I learned to never judge a book by its cover. I met 11-year-olds and 70-year-olds along the way on the trail. I found that it is a small world after all, and you really can just walk anywhere that you want. I learned from my own personal tribulations that something always goes wrong. I have a large amount of faith in the hiking community in general. I actually received more hitches along the way without asking than with asking. And finally, thank you so much to my family, my parents and my brother for being there for me, supporting me in my journeys and uh, catching up with me along the way. So thank you so much.